The Hudson Library and Historical Society's Through the Eyes of the Artist Biographical Series presents art historian Felicia Zavarella Stadelman speaking about French artist Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on January 8, 2015. Good evening. Welcome to the Hudson Library. Tonight continues our series of featured artists. Um, at the conclusion of the program, we really do appreciate your feedback. We'd love to hear what you think about our programs. And if you have any suggestions of programs you'd like to see, we are very interested in your feedback. Tonight continues our program, our, um, program of featured biographical artists by Felicia Zavarella Stadelman. Tonight she's going to present on Toulouse, Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec. So we're anxious to hear what she has to say. Good night. Look at how many of you came out in the cold. I'm really impressed. You could be home in front of your fireplace, but instead you've got to hear this great story. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec always gives me a hard time. I have to tell you, I've been doing these lectures for, my daughter's 23 for 25 years. Every time I do a Toulouse-Lautrec lecture, something happens. Nothing serious, but always enough to, you know, like the water tank breaks or the dog runs away. Today I couldn't close my car door. I had just told my daughter, I'm doing this presentation, nothing happened today, and I got in my car, it was frozen. So I had to drive here hanging on to the, fortunately I live in Hudson, but holding on to the, my, I didn't have another car, so anyway, leave it to Toulouse, because I, I tell the true story about him, you know, he kind of haunts me. Henri Marie Raymond de Toulouse Lautrec Montfa, that's his full name. He was born on November 24th, 1864, in the provincial town of Albi in the southwest of France. His father was Alphonse. Le Comte de Toulouse-Lautrec, and his mother's name was Adele, they were descendants of one of the oldest and most prestigious families in France. Now Toulouse was the heir and the last in a long line of this aristocratic family that dated back 1,000 years. However, the child's aristocratic stock did him much more harm than good, although his parents seemed to be complete opposites. His father was a wild, eccentric hunter of women as well as animals. Uh, his mother was quiet and very devout. Unfortunately, they were first cousins. Now, he grew up in one of the oldest families in France with ancestors who had fought in the Crusades. The French aristocracy had very little po political power by the late 19th century, but the Lautrec family was very, very wealthy, and they kept apartments in Paris as well as country estates all around Albi, uh, not far from Toulouse in the southwest area of France. Now, although he first appeared as a beautiful, healthy child, young Henri had inherited a congenital weakness of the bones because of the family inbreeding, which went on for generations. During his early teens, he had two accidents 15 months apart, which left the young boy with two broken legs, requiring months of convalescence. Drawing was one of the activities he could continue to pursue during these painful months of healing and adjustment, and by the time he was 16, it was evident that his legs would not develop properly, although the rest of him grew very normally. He attained the height of only four, four and a half feet, and many um, art historians believe he was really only four, four. But by way of cruel compensation, nature rewarded Toulouse-Lautrec with the full attributes of manhood, a thick beard, a rich voice, and a lively libido. He would always say during an interview, I may be a small coffee pot, which he was very fond of saying, but I have a very big spout. <laughs> now, I'm warning you, if you ever look up anything about Toulouse-Lautrec, you're going to get all kind of ads that you really don't want to see. <laughs> and I've had my computer crash many times because of my lookups about, so I'm just warning you, fair warning, you know, all of a sudden you're going to say, this is a mystery, and that's why. 
He had a lively libido and, uh, and an interesting coffee bud. Okay, with a normal torso but shortened legs, he would always quip about the fact that he could get falling down drunk without any harm because he was so close to the floor. Whatever it did to his appearance, the crippling accidents of his childhood certainly changed his life. He was, now Alphonse, his father, was deprived of his hunting companion that he had expected in his son. So Alphonse detached himself further and further away from his family, leaving Henri in the care of his adoring mother, who encouraged him to develop his talents of drawing and painting. His father was a passionate hunter and a flamboyant eccentric. He once showed up in a tutu for lunch at his parents' chateau. He very often would do things just to embarrass his wealthy family. He was a notorious womanizer. He had very little time for his wife and especially for his son, who turned out to be a big disappointment in his words. Henri had an ambivalent relationship with his father. He felt resentment because of his absence, but he also felt fascinated by his glamour. Now, apart from the traumatic accidents, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec's early years were relatively uneventful. Much of his childhood was spent at the Chateau du Bosque, which was the home of his grandfather, who was known as the Black Prince. His cousins provided him with company. The days were spent playing croquet, badminton, collecting tiny horses and coaches, which was his childhood passion. Incidentally, he kept those until um, the time of his death. And there are many uh, notations about, and letters written about the fact that even as an adult, he would play with these little horses and coaches. Um, he also learned Latin and English. Now, his father and uncle were accomplished draftsmen. The young Henri seemed to have received some encouragement from them. And by the age of 14, he was being tutored professionally by an artist who specialized in hunting and horses and subjects along that realm. Amateur painting was kind of a tradition of the family. His grandfather, his great-grandfather, his father, his uncle, they were all painters as a, a, as a hobby. And the young Henri had been an avid sketcher from very early on. Now his father and uncle were talented amateur painters who preferred the art that portrayed animals that they hunted and the horses that they rode. And that's why the early works that were done by Henri were done in that genre. But as an only child, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec did have a brother that died in infancy. He was kind of doted on by his religious mother, and he would remain dependent on her and resentful of that for the rest of his life. Among his friends, he would call her my poor sainted mother, but when she would talk to him about the fact that he was dining with a special woman of some elegance, he would say, stupid mistake, uh, the girl in question is nothing but a, a tart. The only person I truly love is you. So he always uh, was devoted to her, and yet behind her back, he was resentful of his relationship. After some early training in sporting art and a brief but very unhappy stint as a high society portraitist, his mother eventually moved him to Paris, where she thought he might get better training, art training. In 1884, Toulouse-Lautrec was 20 years old. He was a student at uh, the art studio of a painter by the name of Fernand Cormont. And at the time, the French art world, at the time when Toulouse-Lautrec entered the scene, the French art world was divided between academic painters like Cormont, who exhibited their work at the Salon, uh, the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, and the other half of this was the radical Impressionist artists who were showing their paintings at the Independent Salon. Now, the radicals had been attacking the official French culture of painters for a generation, and they uh, wanted to kind of drag their art through the gutter, if you will, to take a look at the way life really was, rather than these uh, religious, moralistic paintings that were uh, being recreated by the classical art, uh, academic artists of the time. And Lautrec's teacher, Comon, was very well known for this tableau called Tableau of the Stone Age. But 
he knew that his students were a little tempted by these new radical artists, and he was encouraging them to go into the streets uh, and learn what the art of the, 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 the art of the streets was all about. Uh, soon enough, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec was doing the academic classical French style of painting by day, and then by night he was dragging his art through the gutter. He uh, entered Carmont's studio, and he showed very little signs of originality or greatness. This was the comment by Fernand uh, Cormon. At most, uh, he said that a series of sketches that Henri made were, um, had something about uh, detail in them, but he wasn't really impressed with his work. Uh, to answer that, Henri said, I have tried to draw realistically and not ideally. Cormon actually thought that Toulouse-Lautrec's drawings were atrocious in his own words, and he said he needed to try to strengthen Henri's sense of form. But as time went on, and as Toulouse-Lautrec's mother became more and more generous with her tuition, uh, Cormon was more positive about his talents. Uh, Henri said during this time when he was training with Carmon, he said, it may be a deficit, but I have no mercy on warts. I like to adorn them with straight hairs and make them bigger than life and shiny. And of course, Carmon wasn't really uh, working on the kind of art that was being dragged through the gutters, if you will. So for two years, uh, Toulouse Trek studied under Carmon, lived with his mother in an elegant residential section of Paris, and daily went to the studio with a nice large check. By 1885, he was beginning to find his feet as a young painter in Paris. And the scene that he stepped into was this working class district known as Montmartre, which was notorious for its thieves and brothels, as well as its, as its hangouts for the avant-garde artists, as well as the literary anarchists. Montmartre wasn't always the way, uh, you know, you hear about it in a song by Maurice Chevalier. This was kind of the underbelly of Paris that was just in the outskirts of the fashionable areas where uh, many of the working people uh, hung out, the working class hung out. But the scene was this suburb, in, um, uh, in the, a village suburb in the northern area of of Paris, kind of midway between the fashionable boulevards and the outer industrial district. And it was rapidly becoming a center of popular entertainment and a haven for these new radical artists. So it was a perfect scene for Toulouse-Lautrec, who was just trying to find his way. And he wanted to work there. But his parents disapproved. As a matter of fact, his mother forbid him from crossing a certain street to go over to the other side. And she refused to give him money to rent a studio. So he left home, he writes in a letter to her. And he moves in with a friend by the name of René Grenier, who was another painter who worked in Cormont's studio. And he wanted to be uh, closer to his work. He wanted to escape, in his words, the somewhat oppressive atmosphere of his mother's house. And although they left on good terms, they regularly lunched together, of course, to get his uh, allowance. Um, Grenier and his ex-model wife, Lily, were the ones who were the influence on Toulouse-Lautrec at this time, and they were good companions. At this point, however, his friends and his new environment became the dominant influence in his life, as well as his development as an artist. And they took Henri to parties, to dance halls, to cabarets. Photographs of them, many photographs of them, show them dressed up in kind of masquerade, exotic costumes, um, always attending one gala party uh, after another. Meanwhile, there was another set of friends at Cormont's studio, Emile Bernard, Vincent Van, Co Van Gogh, and Louis Aquentin, who were now widening uh, uh, Deleuze-Lautrec's horizons uh, artistically in art, and they helped him to find his own style. In 1886, uh, with the influence of uh, Vincent van Gogh and Emile Bernard, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec uh, eventually convinced his parents 
that he could find his way and he was developing this new style of art. And they eventually agreed to provide him with a big enough allowance to rent his studio, to share a flat with another friend, a medical student by the name of Henri Borges. And with his aristocratic pedigree and living on his family's uh, income, he was able to kind of set off on his own in the southern area of France. Now both his studio and his flat were in Montmartre where this little artist with his pince-nez, bowler hat, walking stick had now become a very particularly uh, familiar sight, especially at night in, in the area of the Montmartre region where all of these anarchists and artists and townspeople, uh, uh, working class people lived. He was witty and gregarious by all accounts in uh, letters that have been written about him. He loved to be the center of attention, but his heavy drinking and his often outrageous behavior caused one of his close friends to comment that Henri is seen only as a midget, a drunken, vice-ridden court jester whose friends are criminals and girls from the brothels. And this was a reputation that followed him throughout his life. It was hardly redeemed by his friendship with such other uh, social outcasts like Vincent van Gogh and the anarchist Felix Fenian, who had just bombed a cafe in Paris, uh, and, and Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was in his company when it happened. His life, however, settled into a regular pattern of staying up late into the night, drinking cocktails and wine, talking, drawing, painting, sleeping occasionally, but working furiously. He became a part of this Montmartre scene, and he began to be influenced by the anti-impressionists as well as the impressionists. Now, the studio students from the uh, academic schools of art would often rub elbows with this um, new impressionist group of artists and other avant-garde artists at the local cafes to kind of see what was going on in the art scene. But making his mark in a world of such original painters was no easy prospect. He greatly admired the work of his neighbors, uh, Edgar Degas, but the, um, of one of his neighbors, Edgar Degas, but the elder artist uh, only took a passing notice of, of him, saying that some of Lautrec's studies of the women in brothels, and according to Edgar Degas, actually smelled of disease, so he kind of stayed away from him. Lautrec picked up the painting style of another one of his neighbors, uh, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and he kind of imitated and, and uh, reproduced uh, the work of, of uh, Renoir uh, by recreating the Moulin de la Galette, the, the inside of this cafe that all of the artists would meet at. Um, incidentally, Picasso also reproduced. Renoir did it first. Toulouse attracted his own version. Renoir had kind of a poetic look to it. You could hear the music, smell the food, uh, and smell the perfume, hang around with the people that were in the picture. Toulouse Lautrec kind of had a, a, a more realistic look at it, and of course Picasso had his own version of it being more of a graphic modern style. Uh, this was a dance hall, the Moulin de la Galette, that was at the top of Montmartre's Hill where the shop girls and the laborers showed off their finery, their fancy footwork. And Renoir had always painted these, these scenes inside of the cafes as dazzling, impressionist light, brushing away all of the Moulin de la Galette's grimmer realities of the pimps and the prostitutes that lurked in the shadows. For Toulouse-Lautrec's more realistic image of uh, La Galette, uh, he made sketches of the hall, and then from his realistic uh, in, uh, relationships that he had with the people that were in the scene, and then he would paint the final canvas in the studio where Pierre Renoir would actually get to know people, find someone that he wanted to uh, reproduce on his canvas, and then he would set up his easel and, and paint everyone in the scene. But this painting, this one uh, of the Moulin de la Galette, was immediately reproduced 
uh, as an illustration in Le Courier Francais, which was a popular Paris, Paris newspaper at the time. And then this painting, because of its exposure in this magazine, was eventually exhibited at the 1889 Salon of the Independence Artists, those radical Impressionists that set up their own exhibitions. Now, Theo Van Gogh saw this painting and it was kind of creating a bit of a stir in the uh, radical environment of art. And Theo van Gogh was an art dealer at the time. And he wrote to his brother Vincent about this painting being in the show of the independence. And he felt that Deleuze Lautrec had a very powerful effect in his work. Uh, especially La Balle at the Moulin de la Galette. He felt it was very good and wanted to have the opportunity to sell it. Now, Toulouse Lautrec very often met with Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, Van Gogh. He and Van Gogh were kind of competing a bit for Theo Van Gogh's attention. And Vince, Vincent was feeling a little uncomfortable about what was going on in Paris at the time, the fact that he was being criticized and not really accepted by the radical artists. And Toulouse Lautrec recommends to him that he leaves for Arles and creates a studio in the South. The main reason why Toulouse Lautrec wanted him to leave is because Theo Van Gogh was now starting to get a little interested in his artwork and he didn't want the competition of Vincent. Little did he know, no one was really interested in Vincent Van Gogh's artwork. But they did lunch together for three weeks uh, on and off prior to Vincent Van Gogh's uh, departure and one week before Vincent fatally committed suicide, uh, shot himself in 1890. Now by 1888, Deleuze Lautrec's work was now beginning to sell. And this dazzling new uh, Moulin Rouge dance hall was, that had opened up in Montmartre was one of the places where a lot of the people from Paris, the upstanding people from Paris, and the shop workers, et cetera, were starting to mingle together. And he created a poster advertising this dance hall. Uh, it was this poster. Uh, circus poster, and it graced the entrance hall of this newly opened dance hall. Henri Toulouse-Lautrec uh, particularly enjoyed cabarets. One of his haunts was the very famous Le Chat Noir, and it had been taken over by a singer by the name of Aristide Bruant, and it was his new club. <coughs> It had this coarse cabaret style, and that very much appealed to Lautrec, who had become a frequent customer. The artist and the singer became very close friends, and uh, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec made posters featuring Bruant, who had just opened up this, this singer who had opened up this cafe, with his dark corduroy worker's jacket, the wide black hat, bright red scarf, and the scowling features of this man who eventually became his best friend. Uh, he again did this poster as a favor, like he did the circus poster earlier, to advertise the cafe's opening. Only the more adventurous uh, bourgeois Parisians would actually risk a night out in these sordid precincts of Montmartre, and the Moulin Rouge was now set on the affluent edge of the district, and these posters were an effort to kind of attract a broader public. In 1891, Bruant again turned to Lautrec and commissioned him to create another poster promoting a cabaret that he was opening. Now the big attraction at the cabaret, uh, the Moulin Rouge cabaret, was this strawberry blonde dancer whose name was Louise Leber Weber, and she was better known as La Goulou, which translated means the glutton. She was a former laundress, a part-time prostitute, these are in her own words. Uh, she said that she had one note at the Moulin de la Galette for dancing the newly erotic can-can. She claims to have modeled for Renoir, which she did. And she was otherwise noted for kicking the top hats off of the men's hat, heads while she danced. All the men in the front row had their top hats kicked off by her. One patron describes her as a strange girl with a vampire face, the profile of a bird of prey, a tortured mouth, and metallic eyes. Now, Henri had painted her before, but he made her the focus of his newest poster design. 
Uh, the poster was six feet high and three feet wide. And it showed Lagulu on stage with her leg on the air, a male dancer in the foreground gawking at her revealing petticoats. Now, what's unusual about this poster is this Japanese kind of a, a, a print uh, graphic that had not been seen in Paris up to this point. Also, in the background, those floating yellow lights advertised that there was electricity in this building. So the electric lights was kind of a come on to uh, go into the Moulin Rouge. And then, of course, showing her petticoats was very risque at the time. Uh, this, the uh, back silhou uh, black silhouettes in the background as well were very radical. This poster was shocking to the people of Paris. Everything about it was visually radical. The scandalous image, the strong flat forms that were borrowed from the Japanese prints, the black silhouettes that were playing in the background, the bold lettering, the graphics, these were all inventions of Toulouse Lautrec's own mind, things that had not been created before. And he used these electric globes advertising the, or the yellow globes advertising the electric stage lights, which were new in Paris, to make these vivid patterns across the poster. So it had kind of a touch of abstract art that no one had ever really seen before. The poster was made by color lithography, which was a process by which an image is drawn on a limestone plate, and then it's inked and printed one color at a time. He actually had to learn the method um, from a printer that he worked with and then modified it to fit the large size of his posters. The posters actually had to be divided up and printed on one of three stones and then assembled on se with separate stri strips of paper when they were eventually hung. Now, in late 1891, there were 3,000 copies of this poster that appeared on walls all around Paris. And the, um, post, the Parisians were used to the, the designs of posters by artists like Jules Charest, but Toulouse-Lautrec's images were something altogether new. One uh, person who made note of this during the time that he saw the posters go up, he said, I still remember the shock I had when I first saw the Moulin Rouge poster carried along the Avenue L'Opera on a kind of a small cart. Everyone was enchanted, and they would walk alongside of the posters on the pavement. Now, I want to tell you a quick story about this poster. I've done lectures all over the East Coast. I lived in Rhode Island for a while, and so I did lectures in New England. and. Many people along the East Coast uh, were wealthy. This uh, facility that I went to that was a retirement community, very often out of the 125 people that came to every lecture, someone would tiptoe out and then come back in with an original Picasso or a, I told you, a vase from Tiffany that you know she was going to give to me. And so one day, this beautiful French woman who always sat in the front row said, when you do toulouse the trek, I have a surprise for you. Well, some people would bring in posters that they bought at garage sales, but many of them brought in originals, so I was a little excited. When I arrived that day to cameramen outside of this facility and a Brinks truck, I wasn't sure that it was for me, but I was kind of hoping that it was. From the Boston Museum of Art, she had a poster, which was this one, uh, brought in in a porcelain box. And it cost her $25,000 to take it from the Boston Museum of Art to bring it to Rhode Island to this facility called Laurel Mead. And next to me stood the original poster that one of her family members had peeled off the wall when it went up way back when in Paris. So every time I see this, I think of this beautiful woman. I talk to her family all the time. And she was so excited that as I was talking about it, she was shaking her hands and you know looking at the poster. So anyway. These posters still exist. I can't even imagine, like Antiques Roadshow, if we ever found something in our garage, let's just, we'll split it, but I'll make sure that it gets, it gets shown. <laughs> These posters um, were uh, what kind of defined Paris of the 1890s. When we look at these posters, we could hear the music in the background. We can envision what was going on. It was an icon, a decade that was known as the Belle Epic 
which was a time in Paris when there were no morals, no boundaries, things were changing very quickly. And the swagger of that singer, songwriter, Aristide Bruant, with his black cap and his red scarf, the black stocking dancer, Jane Avril, with her swirl of an orange skirt, the pale face punctuated with red lips. We can all picture what Deleuze Lautrec captured in the essence of these stars and the images that became um, part of the Paris night during the 1890s. His posters became so popular that some Parisians, like this family, were known to follow the workmen that were hanging them so that they could peel these posters off the walls before the glue dried. Uh, in the newspapers, they would say, who will deliver us from the likeness of Aristide Brandt? Because hundreds of posters would be around Paris, and the, the, the newspapers l would lament about how many of these posters were around. You can't go anywhere without finding yourself face to face with one of these stars. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was immediately acclaimed as the foremost poster artist in Paris during this time. Within a decade, he would become famous for his spectacular posters of the Moulin Rouge and other par Parisian dance halls. And more than a century later, the black stockinged, high kicking dancers with their layered petticoats and the plumed hats remain some of the most popular and striking images defining modern, modern art. Throughout the decade, he produced many prints for collector's albums, menu cards, theater programs, book illustrations. He took his work very seriously, and he gained great professional respect from the Parisian printers because he was developing this new style of creating these very large posters on, on three limestones uh, and then and hanging them in Paris. However, he would often arrive in the morning still dressed in his evening clothes. He would work right through the day without a break. With this independent income, he didn't have to earn a living from his work. He only painted what interested him, and very often he did it for his friends without receiving payment at all. His portraits, however, are a gallery of his friends and associates that he knew during this time, the Belle Epic in uh, Paris. Despite his charm, uh, his intensity, his vivacious personality, he was not altogether a great friend. He dominated and bullied all of the people that towered over him physically. His wit was frequently vicious, even to his friends. He always had feelings of inadequacy that caused him to be rude and abrupt. But on balance, despite his problematic character, he had to be a very interesting and entertaining friend. He would very often leave lithographed menus and invitations to many parties and di uh, dinners that were given by himself and his friends. And the menus were always elaborate meals with elaborate drawings. Uh, high-spirited, playful. His cooking and his, uh, he was very well known for mixing exotic drinks and his love of masquerade made him an excellent host and an excellent guest. He was the master of ceremonies or the bartender at very many parties given by many influential Parisians. He was very well known for his fantastic cocktails as well as his cocktail napkins. Now, art historians believe that he's the first one who put comic images, caricatures, on cocktail napkins. Because when he would have parties, he would do a little sketch of you before you started drinking and after you were drinking a little too much, and he would leave these behind. And he created some amazing portraits at these parties. Now, in the 1890s, he became fascinated by theater, and he began to mix more with the highbrow circles. By the late 1890s, he was now exhibiting his work on the European continent, in England, as well as in the US. And he was starting to design theater sets, uh, adding new different techniques to his art of lithography, becoming very well known and commissioned by many people for his posters. But the beautiful epic period that he lived in was not all part, uh, was not all about the beautiful. And unfortunately, Deleuze Lautrec and his friends were kind of part of the darker side. His liaisons, for example, in the brothel world were not all um, artistic. He, uh, 
he would boast that he, and these, in, these are his words, that he preferred unadorned sexual encounters to love. He would say, ah, love, you can sing about it in any key you want, but hold your nose, my dear, hold your nose. Now, if you sing about desire, we would understand each other, but love, there is no such thing. However, there was an artist model by the name of Suzanne Valadon. Does that name sound familiar? Okay, Pierre Renoir's mistress. They had a child um, who became Michelle uh, Utrillo. Uh, anyway, she was a talented painter at the time. He described her to his mother as nothing but a tart over and over. She came as close to anyone to capturing his heart according to letters that he wrote, friends who wrote letters about their relationship. By all accounts, they were lovers for many stormy years. And he wrote a letter to her at one point, my beauteous Suzanne, my petite artiste, my free-spirited one, my talented one and my very treacherous one, I cannot trust you, believe you, or accept you for an instant, and I know you will destroy my life and my soul if I let you, yet I am still helpless to fight what I continue to feel for you. Dealing with your free spirit is like dealing with the wind, and you drive me wild. She was known for flying down a banister at one of the cafes with nothing but a rose in her teeth. Now, he kept her in his life, but he would never commit to her, even after she proposed marriage to him on three separate occasions. She became his companion, his hostess. He adored her son, Maurice. He spent endless hours with him. Unfortunately, Maurice Utrillo was introduced to alcohol by Deleuze Lautrec. He became a destructive alcoholic, but he uh, was, was in love with uh, Toulouse Lautrec as kind of his guardian father, someone that he looked up to because his mother was often gone and, and uh, they, they lived uh, near each other and Toulouse Lautrec kind of took on the guardianship role for Maurice Utrillo. He describes Suzanne Valadon, or uh, Toulouse Lautrec describes Suzanne Valadon as a lively wit, biting tongue, vivacious, earthy with a radiant spirit, occasional histronics, and a directness in her opinion. He would also write, her petiteness always made me appear taller. Uh, these are paintings that Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec painted of Suzanne Valadon. If there was any romance in his life, it was with Suzanne. He had many friends. The prominent ones were uh, Jane Avril, who was nicknamed La Melanite after a type of explosive. She was also a dancer with the petticoats. Um, many described her as a wild Botticelli-like creature, perverse but intelligent, whose madness for dancing encouraged her to join this very strange company, this company who became eventually toulouse lautrecs entourage. Now, just as Avril inspired some of his more striking posters, the last one that he created of her depicts her with this snake coiled around her skirt. She's also rendered in some of his more tender portraits. Avril saw Toulouse Lautrec in his best light, and he, she would even condone his relationships that he had with the women from the brothels. She would say they were his friends as well as his models. In his presence, they were just women, and he treated them as equals. But his way of life, uh, his choice of friends, uh, the kind of paintings that he was creating profoundly offended his aristocratic family. His father disinherited him. His uncle burned several of his paintings. Only his mother stayed close to him as long as she could bear him, she said. Near the end of his life, she fled to Paris to be away from him. She did continue to support him financially, but from a distance. Now, in toulouse lautrecs uh, generation, French anarchism could turn violent. A bomb was tossed into the legislature in 1893, and a French president was assassinated the next year. Many of the people that were accused of these deeds were friends of toulouse lautrec But in Montmartre, he translated those acts of terror into what was called radical art. He contributed illustrations to several literary journals that kind of had an anarchist bent. His friends were all members of a group called the Incoherence. He didn't produce political um, art. He did this art in kind of a radical way to help promote their cause. 
um, these abstract graphic designs positioned him once again as probably the most modern of the modern artists. At this point, he was probably making a place for himself much closer to Picasso than to Degas, Renoir, uh, the other Impressionist artists. Even now, he remains a uh, modern artist. In his prints of celebrities, um, he kind of can be seen as the Andy Warhol of his era. La Goulou, for example, and Jane of Rill are always compared to Warhol's Marilyn Monroe. However, he seemed to be driven to squander his glory by drinking himself into the grave. And it was obvious to all that were concerned with him that he had become an alcoholic. Friends rallied around, tried to take him away from Paris and all of the temptations. Maurice Joyant, who was an old schoolmate, would take him to the coast for yachting weekends, and they would visit England together just to keep him away from the influences of the scene in Montmartre. Joyant uh, arranged one-man shows for Toulouse-Lautrec in uh, Goupil's Regent Street Gallery. The exhibition was a total failure, but at this point, Toulouse-Lautrec didn't really care. He had kind of lost all interest because of his alcoholism. At the height of his success, there were nights when he would disappear, eventually dragging himself through the gutter, he would say, as if taking Corbet's, Cormand's uh, prescription quite literally when he said this new radical style of art was dragging art through the gutters. Towards the end, hallucinations, paranoia, all induced by alcoholism and uh, diseases that you get from women in brothels, uh, kind of overwhelmed him. On one occasion, when he was visiting friends in the country, they heard a shot from his room, and they found him sitting on the bed with a pistol. He was trying to shoot at the attacking spiders. So he was hallucinating very often uh, at this point in his life. He eventually was committed to a private asylum just outside of Paris where his mother visited him three times a day. The terror of being locked up for good seemed to spur him on to rapid recovery, however. He started drawing again and he produced a brilliant series of circus drawings while he was in the asylum. Uh, and he did this from memory to try to convince his doctors that he was sane and that he was recovering and that he didn't want to be locked up any longer. Finally, his mother, the Countess, removed him from the sanitarium and a cousin was hired to supervise him at all times. His cousin tried to distract him with holidays on the coast, visits to the opera, uh, but it was a little too late for, Henri, late for Henri at this point. After 11 weeks after being out of the asylum, he was soon drinking again. At 36 years old, he already looked like an old man. And in the summer of 1901, while taking a sea air near Bordeaux, he collapsed. His mother fetched him, took him back to their home, and took care of him. He spent his last days in his mother's garden where he often painted her, and he died in her arms, 1901, shortly before his 37th birthday. Ironic because Vincent van Gogh died at 37 as well. His life, however, was romanticized in John Huston's 1952 film, Moulin Rouge. His last uh, words were, I should have paid more attention to my art. Um, Moulin Rouge, Jose Ferrer played a great uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, there was a biography written in 1994 called Toulouse-Lautrec, A Life. If you can get a hold of that, it's a wonderful book. His world, his wild palette were all um, evoked in, into this book. There was also a movie called Moulin Rouge that was based loosely on the life of Toulouse-Lautrec. His art is always on a traveling display at a number of different galleries. Generally, they call his exhibition uh, Toulouse-Lautrec and Montmartre, and it, would, it draws the largest crowds uh, on an average from opening day till the end. Today, we know Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec as the bohemian artist of the beautiful era in Paris, the last decade of the 19th century, and his images evoke 
the sights and the sounds that we remember about this time. In this trick photography, which he created, he captures the spirit and the emotion of his playfulness. Um, although his handicap and his alcohol abuse kept him from enjoying some of life's pleasures, he certainly did enjoy the joie de vivre of the time. Now, in an auction at Christie's, a new record was made for Deleuze Lautrec's poster. This is um, Suzanne Valadon. It's called A Young Laundress. It sold for $22.4 million. He said, I have tried to do what is true and not ideal. And that was the, the way in which he lived. And that's the story of Deleuze Lautrec. I know it's a little shorter. He had a short life. So thank you so much. Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the Through the Eyes of the Artist series for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.